Jabez, yung naka-live dito, ano? Lecture 1, Cebu 2023, Prochor's Algorithm Series. Oh, sorry po. Uh, wait. I think may settings na template na ginamit ko si Kuya Asher before. Sige. Looking for the Zoom link. Okay, ano ko na sila, no? Okay po, sige po. With lots of cheese. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, cheese. This is JB's ice soil. Ayan, hello. Good afternoon. Ayan, so if you have friends pa, if you have friends that are still not in the call, please message them or send or uh, just tag them on Discord or something so just so that uh, we can start on time. Okay, so hello, hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to finally meet you. Ayan, okay. Hello. Ayan, meet ko muna lahat ah. Okay, so we're also live on Facebook and uh on the YouTube channel of One Quantum PH. Okay. Ayan, hello. People are coming in pa on the waiting room. Let's just wait for them for a few moments. Ayan. Okay. So again, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I hope that you are fine and you are comfy. Even if it's the weekends and you want to rest or or you want to take some time for yourself. But uh, thank you for being here. Now uh, taking time uh, to learn with us. Ayan. So we officially welcome you all to the uh, Cebu 2023 Quantum Computing Lecture Series and the Hackathon. So we hope to enjoy the six week of six weeks of uh, lecture lectures throughout October and November and then we hope to see you on the in-person event uh the hackathon at culminating hackathon on CITU okay so before everything else some session norms okay so uh, we ask everyone to please uh, engage actively immerse yourself in this learning experience and of course be open okay uh we are here to have a meaningful conversation with each other ask away okay so there are no dumb questions here. Do not be afraid to ask when you need to, especially for this very new, very, uh, some of us that doesn't even know what quantum is, right? So uh, ask away, there are no dumb questions. And of course, to respect everyone. Let's give each other our undivided attention. Okay, so before anything else, uh, let me ask you this. How are you today? Okay, so uh, can you chat? Can you chat? Um, Wait, let me turn it on. There we go. Ayan. Okay. So how are you today? Just type one. If you're just happy that you survived. Ayan. 
And then type two if you're chill, type three if you're excited. Okay, so I I got three, I got three, I got fine, thank you. I got a groovy. Oh, a lot of ones, a lot of twos, very mixed. Oh, one is simultaneously one and three. Love me my coffee. Okay, it's already 5 p.m., but you're still drinking your coffee. That's okay. And then we're still getting some twos, some trees. Okay, so we hope that uh, this time would be super chill for everyone, that uh, it won't be too much of a burden mentally. We've, we've gone through so much throughout the week already, but we hope that this would be enjoyable for you. especially we when we are introducing new topics, okay? All right. Again, if you have some friends that are still not on the call, please tell them or message them to join the call uh, just so that uh, they can they won't miss this onboarding session. So some people are still putting one, two, three, <laughs> uh, mixed emotions and mixed signals. Okay. Thank you for your uh, participation, active participation. Okay, so we are 94 already on the call. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so before ever, anything else, so we want to introduce ourselves. I am Jabez Ison, the uh, Director of Operations here at One Quantum Philippines or Quantum Computing Society. So uh, we've messaged already on email. So if you're receiving some of the emails, so I'm sending those out. So hello, uh, I'm glad to finally meet every one of you. Okay, so um, aside from me, no, it's, not, it's not all about me. It's all about the community and the society. So what is One Quantum PH? What is the Quantum Computing Society of the Philippines? So we are a community-driven organization and we are dedicated to advanced quantum computing here in the Philippines. So we are registered on the SEC. Okay, so uh, SEC or Stack Securities Exchange Commissions here in the Philippines. Uh, that's uh, We're registered as Quantum Computing Society of the Philippines and Globally, we are a chapter of the One Quantum Global. So here, it's One Quantum Philippines. All right. And also, we are a nonprofit. Okay. Uh, it's more about education, social impact are around here. So we're very glad to finally have this meeting with you all. Okay. To start off, uh, we I would like to call on uh, the president of One Quantum PH and also the board director, one of the board member, I'm sorry, Board, one of the board members of the OST Shared Quantum Technology Board, our very own Mr. Bobby Corpus. Maraming salamat, Jabez. Uh, maayong hapon sa inyong tanan. So my name is Bobby Corpus and uh, thank you for joining the Cebu Lecture Series on uh, Introduction to Quantum Computing. We are very honored. to present this um, series in collaboration with the DOST, Advanced Science and Technology Institute, Cebu Institute of Technology University, University of San Carlos, and IBM Quantum. Quantum computing is a fascinating subject. It's a paradigm shift. It's a completely different way of doing things compared to our uh, daily computing lives. However, it's a pivotal technology uh, of the future. Through this series, which extends over several Saturdays, we aim to provide you with uh, a taste of uh, the subject. And the culmination of this will be a modified hackathon, or you may uh, call it an Olympiad, uh, for our pre-selected uh, participants. So we strongly urge everyone to do the exercises It's the best way to grasp uh, uh, intricacies of quantum computing and uh, collaboration is key. As much as possible, if you can team up with uh, uh, other participants over Discord and uh, discuss solutions, you know, and be able to understand uh, uh, what it is. And for the hackathon participants, um, you will be competing with uh, different schools in solving as many challenges as you can, okay? It will all be about building quantum circuits. So at the end of this series, you should be able to know and program a quantum circuit. So best of luck and here's to a fulfilling learning journey. I'll now hand you over to uh, Jabez. Thank you for that, Sir Bobby. So Sir Bobby already gave us a glimpse of the hackathon. 
and all of our uh exercises. Okay. At this point, I I would also like to call on uh Sir Jeffrey Aborat, the supervi supervising science research specialist at the OSD ASD. Hello, good afternoon, po. Thank you, Jabez. Am I being heard clear? Yes, po. loud and clear. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Um, so first, I'd like to commend everyone who worked tirelessly in organizing this event. And Sir Bob has always been so passionate about quantum computing and making it known to all Filipinos. And his passion is unparalleled. Uh, thank you, Sir Bob. Also, Jabez did a great job in organizing the logistics. And that is why we have our welcome email, our handbook, and our Discord community. Thank you, Jabez. Uh, also, Mom Cherry has been very busy connecting with the universities, colleges, and high schools in the Visayas, and that is why we are all here. Thank you, Mom Cherry. Um, as uh, Sir Baba has mentioned, uh, quantum computing holds many weirdness and promises, and I hope we will all learn a lot, myself included, of course, from the speakers in this lecture series. And in behalf of the DOS, the Advanced Science and Technology Institute, um, and also our director, uh, Director Franz de Leon, I welcome everyone to the Quantum Computing Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Sir Jeffrey. And at this point, we would also like to call on Ma'am Cherry Lynn Santa Romana, the Dean of Computing Studies at CIT. Good afternoon, Paul. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. You know, first of all, I would like to thank, you know, although I think he's not here, you know, Mr. Jun Saa for introducing me to Sir Bobby Corpus. You know, without that introduction, uh, this quantum computing lecture series will probably not have started. I don't know. No, but I'm very, very thankful that uh, you have brought uh, this lecture series in Cebu. So I think that we're very lucky in Cebu. And I'm glad that we have a lot of uh, students and faculty members who have decided to basically hit the challenge now. I think it's a challenge now. You know, I have been in the computing uh, field for a long time, but I feel my nose bleed ako eh. <laughs> if I will start hearing this, and I started attending eh, and I felt na parang, Sir Bobby, it's very hard. And now, can we do a gentle introduction to quantum computing? And so that was the start of the discussion. And I'm very happy that uh, we were able to launch this. And, uh, so thank you very much, Sir Bobby, and the rest of your team, si Jabez, DOST, ASTI. Again, to all of the students and the teachers who are here, and, uh, thank you for taking the challenge. And, uh, we hope that we can produce a lot of uh, people here in Cebu with knowledge on computing, uh, quantum computing in general. And, uh, uh, I, I think there's no other way to go no? uh, in the field of computing. And this is you know the future. So I would like to re request, especially the CIT students, to really uh, take this uh, set of lecture series seriously so that you can become productive now, quantum computing uh, professionals. So thank you again, and welcome to all the participants. Thank you for that, Paul, Mom Cherry. So it really is, quantum computing is really is a paradigm shift, and it's a challenge to upskill ourselves diba, on this very new technology. So lang, it's not really more of, uh, about math and computers. It's more about math, computers, and physics and all of that in between. Okay, so uh, throughout this program, don't worry. Again, uh, as Ma'am uh, Cherry said, that uh, this would be a, a gentle introduction. So that's why we stretched it into six weeks so that we can give extra supplement uh, materials throughout the week so you can uh, gradually build up your knowledge, especially if you don't have that uh, background yet. So we also would like to acknowledge that there are some high school students here. So hello, guys. Thank you for being here. And we are excited for you to to explore and to know more, know more about quantum computing. So um, we would also like to acknowledge Sir Roland from uh, the University of uh, San Carlos, Professor of Physics. I don't think that he's on the call, but uh, he's also have been very helpful on uh, organizing this. Okay, now for our program outline. So um, as I've mentioned earlier, we would have six weeks of lectures every Saturday at this time. So it's uh, 5 p.m. to 5, 7, 5, uh, 7 p.m. here in uh, Philippine time and also around uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. in UTC. Okay, 
So uh, for our first lecture, which is this session right now, uh, it's all about quantum computing unveiled. Wow. Okay, so we will have this opening session, introduction to quantum computing and applications in that as well. So we'll also discuss some quantum modalities and how do we approach quantum computing. So we'll talk about the companies and their techniques that they are using. Okay, so uh, for next week, it's about crunching the numbers, mathematics essential. So we will step back a bit just so that we can brush up on those math and uh, science and uh, programming skills. So we'll review some essential mathematics such as complex numbers, vectors, matrices, binary numbers, logics, and probability. We'll uh, introduce programming again, just a bit of Python programming. We will get you started on IBM Quantum Experience and we will actually write your first quantum program on the next session. So very exciting lecture. And then for uh, lecture three on October 28th, we will unlock the gates to the quantum mysteries. So we will delve into the complexity of algorithms, some quantum concepts as well, such as qubits, superposition, entanglement, tunneling, and measurements. And at this point, we will talk about quantum gates. So it's not really just about math and computers. As I've said earlier, it's more digging about the physics and all those small uh, quantum particles that we are going to talk about. And then at the lecture four, the exploration of qubits and quantum circuitry on November 4. Okay, so we'll talk about qubit states, the block sphere, the visualization of the gate operations and quantum circuits and Qiskit from IBM as well. And then for lecture five, algorithms quantum algorithms, basically, uh, and uh, on, we'll apply that on IBM ex experience, quantum experience, some lectures on cryptography and quantum key distributions. And lastly, on uh, lecture six, we'll have the quantum frontier, what lies ahead, quantum computing in on uh, optimization, the current state, advancement and developments in quantum computing and program conclusion. So. Don't worry if you don't still don't know some of these jargons. So uh, it might sound overwhelming at first, but I'm sure that you will um, enjoy this series. And then at the end, at November 20, for those who are uh, able, uh, eligible, uh, we'll send the guidelines for the hackathon, but we will have an in-person event in CITU. So that would be very, very exciting. Okay, so if you have some more questions or you need some more information, you can refer to the participant handbook uh, that is sent on your emails. So uh, you can check that out. You can read through that. And you can actually uh, know most of the things and about our program. But if uh, you still have some questions unanswered, you can utilize our Discord server. Just tag me there. I check the Discord server uh, throughout the day. Uh, so that I can uh, answer your questions. Okay, so uh, I hope that you're still not sleepy over there. We will now be starting our session two and three to be uh, our speaker is Sir Dylan Josh uh, Lopez. So this would be more about introduction to quantum computing and applications on that as well. Okay, so I would now I would now like to give the floor to Sir Dylan. Hello, Paul. Good evening, Paul. Hi. Good evening, everyone. So, hello, hello. Uh, currently, I'm in Taiwan right now, but I think we're just we just have the same time zone. But hi, and welcome to this event. So, I allow me to introduce to you Quantum, so that you sorry try to have a bit of uh, introduction, of fresh inspiration, and why should we actually do Quantum? Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. So let me just give you a soft introduction to quantum computing. So I'll leave all of the math for the next weeks. So don't worry about that. And let's just focus on how exciting is quantum computing. All right. Great. Okay. So what's up for today? We're going to talk about quantum computing and its applications. Very simple. Just why you need to do this and why quantum computing exists right now. So first is, okay, let's do quantum computing in a nutshell. What's the motivation in doing quantum computing? So 
Now, for those in computing, uh, I think you have heard that Moore's law. So it's a, it's a it actually it's an economic law that uh, the number of transistors that you can cram into a specific IC doubles every year. And actually, this was already this proven in the past few decades and years already, where in quite an exponential number of transistors per year. And right now, we already broke it. We are now already at the limit of Moore's law. Okay, so why is that so? Now think of this, oops, sorry, let me just, there. So the world's finest nano or in, in nano transistor or the nano IC can now have two nanometers nodes in a chip. That means imagine a wire that's just two nanometers wide. And mind you that the electron is around 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 nanometers in observation. Now, if we are putting that limit already, then the computation limit that we need or that we, we can do is already at the limit because we're now putting it in a very fit size to an electron. And if we, our electrons cannot move, then there's no electricity. Then that puts us at a disadvantage that our computing techniques would stop. It, that means we already have a physical limit on what we could do. The best thing that we could do by then is just buying more computers. And that will give us a lot of problems. That means more electricity consumption. That means we're looking at a lot more carbon uh, footprint with different uh, for different uh, places, especially for high-performance computer uh, locations, right? So... We need to find a way so that we can still move on with the evolution of software or technology that means better computers. Now we need to look at a different angle now. What if we're not going to use exactly electronics in building up, or not exactly just the electron, in building up all of our algorithms or digital computing? What if we can use something a bit more strange, and that is now quantum, okay? So quantum computing is a new type of computing, okay? It's not gonna replace, as of the moment, all of the computing things that we have right now, okay? Uh, let me paint you a picture of how would this work in the future. Now, imagine all of your CPUs, your central processing units, all of your ICs right now are cars, and they hold electrons in them or information, and they run through a road, okay? And they run through a road, and all of them has that information, transferring them, computing them, and all sorts of things. Right. Hi, and we could have a lot more, okay? A lot more power if we have bigger cars. We have buses, more electrons transporting into one piece of uh, movement. And we could have trains. So trains could be like uh, GPUs. Like you can process a lot more information at one time or transferring a lot of information into just one piece of movement, right? Now, quantum computing is just like that. The concept is of computing and transmission is you're moving information from one place to another or putting them into, or transforming them to one form or the other. Now, quantum computers are like boats or would be like helicopters. Like they could transfer information faster or more efficient to another place, but not exactly the same way as it would travel like a car. It will travel through space um the air or water okay but the concept is still there it's still transferring information it's still transforming information okay Dylan, can oh, i sorry yes yeah, sir yeah uh, i think there's something wrong with your um microphone oh okay let me try to fix that how about this okay can you, can you continue and uh, uh we'll know. right right hello hello is this fine Yes. Okay. So let me go back a bit. The, the concept yeah. of uh, computing could be summarized like transportation, right? CPUs could be cars, GPUs could be trains, but quantum computers would be like uh, airplanes, okay? They transport people or transfer information, but in a different medium. So that's completely uh, bizarre for a regular car user. But you can't use a quantum computer every day for everyday use, right? You can't just use an airplane to go from your house to the school. 
you can't just power drop anywhere unless you have an airstrip at the at your backyard. So no, but it will be efficient in very specific applications as of now. Okay, so let's just leave that idea there, and you'll get to know why is this uh, the good idea of how to think about quantum in the next few weeks. Right. So we're looking at different applications of quantum computing right now. It's already being used by different countries and different industries and research centers. Now, you'll get to learn how quantum is used for factorization and search. So that goes along with cryptography. How do you protect your data okay, with quantum computing? Because if you are encoding your data using a quantum computer, then that means a regular computer can't decode that because your encryption is in quantum and not everything or not every quantum computing device or quantum computing information could be decoded by classical computers. So that's an advantage there. There's also simulation. Since quantum computing by Richard Feynman, the concept of quantum computing is a machine that's able to simulate quantum mechanisms or a quantum system. And that means we can simulate the idea of a certain object in the quantum level. And what are those? Those could be in chemistry, right? We can now try to formulate all of those material combinations or those compounds with not just uh, digital means, but actual simulations of quantum entities. Those are quantum, uh, we have quantum chemistry in that sense. So we can then easily do that in a quantum computer. Now, there's quantum communication as well. How can you transfer information using the quantum means? There could be a quantum channel that we can transfer information to. We can make sure that our information is already uh, encoded using quantum computers, or it could actually be uh, information could be actually easily transferred or teleported even from one place to another. All right. And that's something interesting that we'll get to know later. And the easiest one that could be implemented in any industry right now would be optimization. We can use quantum computing or the quantum system to find the best combination of things to find maybe the, the cheapest way to go to one place to another. Or what is the cheapest way to build a house? Or what's the best way to build a material? Okay, That could be something that you'd put in a quantum computer and let them solve it for you, which... Normally, computers cannot solve probably in several years, but a quantum computer can solve it in a matter of hours or minutes. Okay, that's something also we're going to look at with factorization and search. Okay. Okay. Good. So, although we're talking about faster, quantum computing is faster, more efficient than most computers. But it's not always the case. So we're looking at complexity that is going to be discussed more in the next few weeks. That we're looking at problems that could be solved by quantum computers that are better than classical computers, but not all the times that quantum computers are better than quantum uh, than classical computers. When you talk about classical, these are your regular computers, your CPUs and GPUs. Okay, now you know you can think of these advantages in three main different things. It could be significant, moderate, or uncertain. When you talk about significant advantage, this is now the true quantum advantage we're in. When you use a classical, I mean, you're a quantum algorithm compared to a classical algorithm in a computer, you can see very significant changes. One of them is Shor's algorithm. Think of this as what we call the RSA encryption that you'll get to know with Sir Bobby in the next few weeks. That if you're trying to break the RSA encryption, let's say for a certain number of uh, bytes, now it might take, let's say, millions of years for a computer to crack, your regular computer. But if you use a quantum algorithm, it could be solved merely in a few minutes or hours. Okay, so that's amazing and scary at the same time. But that holding that kind of power gives you an idea of what quantum computing could do in a several other applications. Another one is Grover's algorithm. Well, you probably get to know in the next few weeks with... Um, quantum algorithms is it's, it's best for using in what we call unsorted database search. Now, say for example, you have 100 uh, names of people, okay? And you want to know, okay? You want to know their telephone numbers, right? Very easy 
uh, example. And you you want to know, like, if it's alphabetical order, you can find someone easily. What's their telephone number? Maybe we're looking for someone named uh, uh, John. So John probably has letter J somewhere in around the middle or just above the middle of uh, the pages that you have. And that's easy to search. But what if we do it the other way around? What if we're looking for John given all of those telephone numbers, right? It's now unsorted. You don't know how, how you're going to sort all of those uh, values, right? If you're, they're just purely random. Worst case scenario is you're going to take 100 times, or that's the length of all of the data points that you have, until you get to an answer. Now, that is the complexity N, right? That's a linear uh, complexity, they're O of N. So that's going to take a long time. If you have that kind of number, it'll take a very significant amount of time. But if you're using, for example, Grover's algorithm, you'll get a complexity of square root of N. That means instead of searching it for N, or let's say you take one second for searching one line. So that's 100 seconds. Okay. If you use uh, Grover's algorithm, you get square root of N. So that's just 10. So you are square root of, 10, square root of uh, n faster than compared to your classical algorithm, which is n, or which is 100, right? So that's, that's neat. So the other one is what we call the uncertain advantage. Now, there are case, it's a case-to-case -case basis. When classical algorithms are faster, and it's a case-to-case -case basis that the quantum algorithms would be faster. Now, when you talk about uncertain advantage, such as for the adiabatic computing, that means we're using thermodynamics or heat, then for a very small amount of data, classical computing would still be faster. However, if the problem scales, then adiabatic computing could be faster or would be faster than classical algorithms. One of them would be for NP-hard problems, such as the traveling salesman problem. Now, that depends on what type of quantum algorithm that you'd be using, right? Now, not all, all algorithms would have significant speeds. So just to break the ice there is that not all algorithms are the same, and they would not have the same speed or advantage as the others. Okay, cool. Now, there is a lot of effort already worldwide, and gladly to say that the Philippines is already investing a significant amount of money, even greater than other countries in the Western countries. Okay, So that means we are already at an advantage of learning, since there is a potential for you as students, as faculty members, to learn quantum computing. And if you do research, and if you try to do it right now, you'll probably get something uh, better support than others. You'll be you'll becoming the trailblazers or pioneers of quantum computing in the Philippines. We have the investment, but we need you right now to start doing research, trying to tinker with quantum computing so that you can show the world and the Philippines that it is possible. And in the next few weeks, you can see it is possible. All right, cool. And right now in the OST, of course, we're, uh, we in the Philippines already have a roadmap and Sir Bobby here is one of the group, uh, one of the people that is making sure that this would be in line, and they're thinking of other ways so that we can hit this off in the Philippines. And you can be one of those who'll be being uh, will becoming the uh, achievers of these strategies in the Philippines. Just imagine that with a new, very new technology in the Philippines, you have now the opportunity and the privilege of starting the new research or discovering new things with quantum computing. So this is the best time for you to learn and actually practice what you have learned to get started with quantum computing. All right? Cool. But, however, everything has a limit. Quantum is not the holy grail of computing out there, okay? It's not just like, uh, it's not also like AI. AI has a limit. It's not the holy grail of everything of computing. So we need to work out ways. And to know until when could we do the quantum uh, the quantum computing strategies. Now, uh, just a brief uh, a bit of briefer uh, before uh, Jabez talks about um, the other types of quantum computers that could be used. But we have several computers that we have right now that do does specific uh, specific things for specific applications. We have the quantum annealer. We have an analog quantum computer and a universal quantum computer. 
right? Right now, um, IBM is working on a universal quantum computer. Those are your digital quantum computers for some, okay? So these are the computers that we envision to be just like your laptops right now in the very, very far future, okay? So what can be, what it be used for? It could be used for security, cryptography, machine learning, simulation, all of those, even search. Uh, those are what quantum, uh, digital quantum computers or universal quantum computers could do. Now, if you have a very specific application such as optimization or simulation, you can opt to some uh, to use a bit more um, earlier. Uh, quantum computers. This could be quantum annealers and analog quantum computers. We're in. We're looking at a very specific or a niche application for quantum computing, which is optimization. So analog quantum computers and quantum annealers would be focusing on the aspect of annealing or quantum annealing. So in this case, uh, we are very specific in optimization, right? So let's just leave it there, and we'll have more of these talks in the later weeks. There's also other types of quantum uh, hardware that you can see uh, in the next few uh, days or later, actually. And we can see that there's a different hardware that could do different types of quantum computing. And which one is better? We'll get to know that in the next few weeks. Now, just an example that a quantum computer is not just purely like, you know, quantum, like everything's quantum from every metal and every wire of quantum, no. Uh, we're just putting it quantum in the processor level or the quantum processing unit or the QPU. In this case, you still have le several layers of electronics that works along with your quantum computer. So for example, in Intel's uh, stack, it has the quantum dot simulator as the QPU, and we'd have a qubit control simulator that's mostly electronics. And to understand what's going on, uh, we tend to measure what would be the value of uh, the quantum computer, right? And the, those qubits actually later. And it could be understood by a regular computer that is your laptop. So we're just gonna connect it with that. So that goes with the same thing that you're gonna experience with coding, that you're coding in your computer. So is it would still be quantum? Yes. What is important is where does your code go later on? It goes to a quantum computer. And we'll get to dive in that in the next few slides, okay? However, right now we have a limit of your quantum computing. We are in what we call the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing era. That means the number of qubits or the information that holds quantum information is still very limited. Right now we're at you know several thousands, it's not updated, but we're now in several thousands of uh, qubits and we need more so that our data or quantum information would not be uh, covered with errors or full of noise, okay? When we talk about noise, there's actually what we call the coherence or the decoherence of quantum information. That means uh, your qubits or that piece of information that holds quantum information needs to be cooled. For example, would be superconducting. You need to cool it down near zero Kelvin. Imagine how cold that is. And that's superconducting. And what if you just adjust it one temperature higher, one Kelvin higher, two Kelvins higher, then suddenly your information gets lost. And that's error. That's noise in the uh, measurement of what you're going to see with that quantum information, right? So we need to find ways to mitigate that error or to correct that error. That could be done in several ways. One, of course, would be using software or algorithms. Another one is to make sure that there, in, there is enough qubits or redundancies to keep that piece of information intact, okay? So once we have enough qubits to make sure that our errors would be covered or it will be gone or significantly very near, near zero, then we'll have very cool computing outputs, okay? So that's something that we need to do in the next few years, especially for physicists. But should we still use quantum, even though it's noisy, right? So I think in, in engineering, we're taught that if it's broken, why are we using it right now? Shouldn't we fix it first before putting it in deployment? Oh, well, my professor did tell me about that, but that's only for the old innovation. Right now, we're looking at innovations to get ready for the future, okay? Let me give you a bit of a history about AI. Uh, some bit probably since you know AI has its uh, 
several success stories nowadays, but a uh, little too uh, little for many that what would be, what was the history of AI in terms of its innovation development? So if you, you watch the uh, um, Alan Turing's movie, I think the imitation game, that's one of the first applications of learning machines. It tracks the code of Germans in way back in the 1940s during the World War II. And that's the start of the boom of artificial intelligence. People wanted to research more. Imagine that convolutional neural networks and the perceptron were, you know, those concepts already existing many years ago, even before, you know, GPUs and CPUs were actually invented. So the math already exists years ago, but, you know, we only, ex we only had it, had the, uh, the fruits right now. So what happened? We had the first AI winter, meaning people stopped researching about AI because they didn't believe on what's its value because we didn't have enough hardware to work on it. So we had that seven years of winter and that's sad, right? Imagine the time, that gap, if people actually believed that AI would work um, good as of now, right? People actually, you know, it had a boom already since they had, they're, they're happy we had hardware already in the 1980s because we have Intel, right? So that's where we got the CPUs, good CPUs to work with artificial intelligence. But it stopped again. Since we have so sophisticated AI, we stopped because, you know, our algorithms or the hardware could not handle the algorithms that we're thinking of. So we stopped again. There's a second AI winter. It boomed again. Uh, the very big boom of artificial intelligence happened during the 2012s or the 2010s. That's where we have the commercially available graphic processing unit or GPUs. Now, there is a trend here that the boom of technology goes along with hardware that goes with AI. Now, should we also do the same? Should we, uh, if knowing this, would you still wait for hardware before you actually do significant research or applications such as ChatGPT right now? What if you know in the future that things would be very fine in computing, that there would be that hardware that would do or give you advantage of technology? Of course, you would try to do something based on the future. But people in the past, not all of them would, do, would think the same. So that's sad. What if we did already had all of the things that you want to do in the future and we're just waiting for hardware, okay? Then we just, we already have all of our innovations in place. We'll be happier. All of us will have high tech, higher technology right now. And that's what we need to do with quantum computing. We don't have to wait for hardware since we know, we'll believe that it will work in the future. And it's happening now. People are having that uh, rigor in doing research. So that will have the hardware ready for a certain period. So we need to work on the software or the ideas, the algorithms, so that when it's there, we know it's there, then you just do your algorithm. It will work. And we'll be now expecting all of the benefits that you know about quantum computing. Okay. So what is the best time to do quantum computing? Right now, before it's actually in the mainstream. So you get to be hipsters of quantum computing. You're doing it before it was cool. But now it's actually cool, but it's not cool enough to keep your coherence. But in the next futures, it will be. All right? Cool. So let's compare it a bit with quantum and classical so that you know for you get an idea how different it is and how com what are the commonalities that you'll be expecting when we're trying to work with it. So in a, let's talk about computer systems. In your regular computer, these are what we call the hierarchy or the abstractions of a computer. We, all, we have physics, the devices. After devices, we'll get circuits. After circuits, you'll, you get to design your logic circuits. Then you have some sort of architecture. We have what we call the assembler. And then your actual computing software, OK? Let's start with the basics. Your classical computer is just, it just focuses on the electron and how it transfers from one place to another. While a quantum computer considers this as qubits, that means the exact electron, we're considering um, not just the flow or not the flow, but rather the spin of a certain electron. And that will give you a certain piece of information for the next times. It's not just zero and one now, it could be any value between zero and one. And that's 
actually amazing. That means you have more information that you can store in one, uh, okay, spoiler, just called qubit, and you'll know that will be more efficient than just one bit, okay? So in a classical computer, you use transistors, while a quantum computer use, or uses couplers to control uh, several qubits. And you have this uh, piece of information, or this superconductor, that controls several qubits together, okay? In a classical computer, you have a CPU. In a quantum computer, you have a QPU. In, log in classical computer, your logic design, for those who are not yet familiar, these are what we call logic gates. And you'll get to know this in the next few weeks. And this is actually, you know, it controls, it actually is a very basic circuit of adding two numbers, but in binary. But you can also do it the same in a quantum computer. They're just changing the language. So it's just like this. In a classical computer, you'll uh, know about the CPU architecture. So we have an, what we call the arithmetic logic unit or ALU in a control unit. But a quantum computer uses another thing. We have uh, quantum registers, we have quantum gates, and we use combined classical computer and quantum computer orchestrations or systems so that we'll get to manage information better in the quantum level. Now, in, assembly la in uh, assemblers, these are actually the very lowest or the low-level language of computing. Or in classical computer, we call this assembly language, where and we get to code the exact memory registers or those uh, very very little uh, chips inside your CPU and your in your motherboard. How does the information go from one place to one place to another? We can create a script or very what we call a low language script called an assembly script where we can move those bits around. A quantum computer can do that as well, but in the level of your, what we call quantum register or quantum memory. And you'll get to know this later when you try to code in Qiskit, there's ha there is what we call a chasm or the quantum assembly language, where and that's what's behind um, any quantum computing programming language that you get to know, okay? And over that, you get to enjoy our classical computers. We have MATLAB, TensorFlow, all of the all of your apps. Those are in your classical computers. You can use it to do whatever you want, any research that you want in classical. Well, the quantum computer, we have several um, stacks or APIs that you could use. We have Qiskit that we'll get to use in the next few weeks. Penny Lane, uh, that's something that you could explore later. But Penny Lane is actually... Um, a Python library that lets you do uh, quantum computing with machine learning. But in between them, C++ could actually be used in both of them. And But uh, that's not covered in our talk, but it's actually very great to know that classical computers and quantum computers could understand C++ in a very certain level, okay? So those are the things that you need to know, or actually you know now about quantum computing. So let me just wrap it up that there is a fine, there is, are very, very big differences between classical computers and quantum computers. Quantum computers have expected advantage at some points, while classical computers are, are the usual thing now. We, can, we are now living in a classical world for now, but once we have quantum, it can work together. So we can imagine a world that you have a CPU, GPU, and a QPU together working to create some sort of great research, okay? And that could lead in a lot more innovations in the future. Last thing, it's now the great time to study quantum, to do quantum, so that we won't be left behind in the future. The Philippines needs to keep up with modern technology, and we don't need to wait for other countries to finish their research to do ours so that we can experience all of their innovations. Now is the best time at the birth and the very infancy stage of quantum to get to know it, to do it, so that once it's there, we're already booming in innovation. All right. So I guess that's it for my, oh, sorry, there's our quantum applications. So that's it for the differences. But now let's talk about how you could actually use it. First is the quantum internet. So the quantum internet is a thing, okay? Um, the U.S. Is already has it has their laws and policies already in creating a quantum internet. South Korea also does. Uh, here in Taiwan, we're already building a quantum internet. But what is it? The quantum internet is a combination of all of your regular internet right now and quantum computing devices. 
Now imagine everything that you're sending internet is very secure. It's uh, it is already encrypted with uh, quantum computing and post-quantum cryptography. And imagine there's a concept what we call quantum teleportation for very secure, excuse me, for very secure data. What if it exists in one place and it suddenly disappears and appears in another place? So just like real teleportation, and actually it it, it could be hap uh, it could be done in your basic quantum algorithms as well. So you can just suddenly transport one piece of information at one end of the world to your end using some sort of hardware or some sort of algorithms as well. There is what we call quantum entanglement. So imagine two qubits at one point, they start you know interacting with one another and you try to pull them apart. Let's say one is in the moon and one is on the earth. And what if whatever interaction that you're doing in the earth, uh, in the earthly qubit, suddenly the qubit in the moon actually reacts. There is a research already done by China where and they have one qubit on Earth and one qubit uh, sent to the uh, to one satellite that they have and they interacted at one point and they observed that one in any interaction or any operation done the one on Earth there is an immediate reaction in the satellite so that's creepy and that's what we call entanglement that you'll get to know in your quantum concepts in the next few weeks. Quantum sensing is a uh, it uses quantum technology to find out, or actually it uses gravit uh, gravitometry to find out things underground without actually drilling. This is one example in Singapore that they're trying to find energy reserves or uh, let's say uh, oil reserves in the underground or under the water, and you don't have to dig to under to know where it is or shake the ground violently to know where are those reserves and use quantum computing and quantum technology to find where they are. And that's amazing. There's also quantum optimization. So this looks very daunting, but don't worry, it's just a piece of blocks. It just tells you that what's the best thing to do or what's the best arrangement to find an answer. Think of it as solving a Rubik's cube using any type of algorithm, but in this case is quantum computing, so yet so that you'll get all of the sides correct. Okay. So this could actually be done using or, or done together with machine learning, because machine learning is based also in optimization. And that's it here. So machine learning, if you're using it right now already, you can also use quantum to solve those things in terms of optimization as well. You can use it for image classification, natural language processing, time series prediction altogether. And you can try to boost up your optimization or even your efficiency with quantum computing. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to do quantum computing. One of them are these, and we'll get to know more as we go through the weeks. Now, I think I'll have another talk by the end of the week on quantum optimization. So something probably daunting, but it's actually one of the things that's very used in the industry right now, whatever industry that you're going to go, they would probably use optimization. And quantum computing could actually be used in making them more efficient, right? So I think that's all for my talk today. And thank you, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, Sir Dylan. So we're going to open the uh, chat box for any questions that you have. Okay. So uh, if there's some concepts that uh, are not yet uh, clear to you, you can send some questions on the chat box. Okay. Okay. While waiting for some questions, Sir Dylan, let me ask, like, um, if I want to... Uh, access a quantum computer or use actual quantum computers can i do it do we have the materials or or do i have to go to the us so that i can access some quantum computers no you can actually access a quantum computer right now especially with uh Kiskit or ibm quantum uh, if you're using ibm quantum and ibm experience that you'll get to know in the next weeks you can actually access one of the quantum computers by ibm in different countries and you run your algorithms there. Now, there are other um, quantum computers out there that use, for example, an adult quantum computer. 
uh, one existing is, is in D-Wave. So you can actually um, access it through cloud. There is a free account just like in IBM so that you can access them. Now, there's another option that you, if, you're, if your schools are very rich or the, will have investment later on in the Philippines, we could get to buy or create a quantum computer here as well. Okay. But if you really don't want to uh, go around, get used to cloud and use your own hardware, we have a lot of techniques that you could use. You can actually use a GPU, your, your for example, A100 or your regular gaming computers. Uh, you can turn them into a quantum simulator at home. You just need to find the right libraries from NVIDIA and they can actually use quantum, is your computer as a quantum computer. Imagine that your gaming setup is also a quantum computer simulator. That's amazing. And yeah, it's actually that actually works. I already tried it last week, and it, it does have significant speed ups with your algorithms. Awesome! Thanks for that, Sir Dylan. We have some questions here from Rafael. Hello. Given that qubits stay in a state of superpositions, are quantum algorithms better for brute force algorithms? And is the opposite true for classical com uh, computers? Is my understanding correct? Well, we don't actually use the term brute force in quantum computing since, um, hmm, in state of superposition, that means we are putting all of those values at one point. I mean, all of them in all different states that all that are possible. So that, in a sense, could be, in a sense, a brute force because everything is there at the same time. And then we'll get the answers at one point. So yes, if your idea of brute force is trying everything at the same time, then yes, because at one go, all of your information, all of the guesses are there. And then you just need to extract it later until you get your certain answers, okay? So in that sense, yes, it's great for brute force uh, in terms of, let's say, um, searching an answer or an unsorted database. That's one uh, That's one guess. But there are other ways that does not use the brute force or superpositions. Uh, one of them would be optimization, and uh, the other one would be for uh, phase estimation, that we don't try to use brute force in that case because we get to use other sophisticated mathematics and uh, quantum mechanical features for your qubits, okay? So are they better for brute force? Yes, uh, if that's the case but not all the times that it would be, uh, we'll be using brute force. All right. Another question. Um, I'm confused on the usage of efficiency and optimization from the explanation. My, que my question is, do quantum computers make optimization algorithms more optimized? All right. So that depends on what type of optimization you are doing. So we have what we call parametric and non-parametric optimization. So parametric optimization, you're going to set what is your objective and what are your constraints. Those are what we call for the operations research. So you'll get to you get to write your own code. I mean, your own mathematics for that. And that is your basis for optimization. Now, quantum computers would be better than classical computers to find what we call the global minima. Because if you try to imagine an optimization, you'll get all of that noise up and down and trying to find where is what we call the optimal point, right? So quantum computing doesn't get stuck much on that one point here. Actually, in this, for example, in this, uh, let's say this is the graph, and this is the global minima. Probably it gets stuck somewhere here, right? So, for example, machine learning tries to find all of the best points right here and gets stuck somewhere here. So that's mach that's the classical computing part. So it doesn't optimize the optimizer or the computation, but rather it guides the particle or the values better to find the better answer. Because one of them, for example, it tries all of the points at the same time and gets to find where is the best answer. Okay. Aside from uh, classical computers that tries it sequentially and tries to learn from the past, or what we call gradient optimization, and it gets stuck somewhere here. But quantum computing, one of them is quantum uh, annealing, gets to tunnel this until it gets to a certain point. So it doesn't optimize the algorithm, but rather it finds better answers by its widening the search of its uh, or widening the search space of a quantum uh, of, a, of the certain algorithm. 
Okay, another question is, do machine learning algorithms get trained in the classical way, but the models get executed by a quantum computer? Or is it both trained and executed by the quantum computer? Actually, both is yes. So there are many ways to do qu machine learning with quantum computing. So you can create a uh, neural network or machine learning algorithm that has what we call the quantum pieces or quantum neural networks or quantum layers. And you optimize it with a classical computer. That's one. Number two is that you have all of your regular uh, machine learning algorithm or neural network, and it's trained by a quantum computer that's also existing. There's also what we call uh, the quantum neural network purely, and you get to train it with a classical computer. So all of those combinations are actually valid, and there are research for that already. Okay. Um... Another one you mentioned earlier that we can build our own quantum computers here in the Philippines. So just like how Intel and TSMC manufacture CPUs, I would like to ask who manufactures these uh, quantum processing units? Well, the individual uh, individual companies do actually manufacture them. Uh, but we do have several startups that actually do uh, research on creating these QPUs. So for example, in Singapore, uh, these QPUs are uh, firstly designed in universities and they become spin-offs or startups that design certain uh, QPUs. Uh, some of them would be using photonics, one of, uh, in, I believe in uh, Spain. So they try to get it off from, uh, from the university and they put it as those designs as their startups. And the manufacturing goes to specialists such as actually TSMC uh, is manufacturing ready quantum computers uh, as a, a spoiler and also Intel. But the designs may not come from them. It may come from another R&D institution or another startup. So we don't have a, what we call a monopoly of those who are generating or creating the QPUs as of the moment. Since uh, right now in the early stage of innovation, most of the peoples are doing a lot of different quantum computer uh, QPUs because we want to find still which one, which hardware design is the most stable when you try to put it in operations. So none of the moment as uh, the uh, what we call the the, mono the monopoly of uh, manufacturing of these electronics. Okay, let me add a question, follow up question. Meron ba? Is there a startup, quantum startup here in the Philippines? I believe there is none. Oh, probably so, one of our participants here would yeah, be Yeah, please do. Founder. Okay. So you mentioned NISC earlier. So one question is, uh, what are the various sources for noise in quantum computing? And is that a reason, reason why uh, the, the, the development is slowing down? Yeah. So the develop actually not just the development, but also operations and the use of quantum computers. Right now, imagine that the quantum computing stage is like ENIAC or EDVAC. Uh, when you see it in the history of computers, one big room and all of the machines are there. Imagine that. That's the same thing. It's con really controlled right now, right now on how we operate the quantum computers. So what are the other noise? You can kick it. So that there's kinetic um, noise as well. So if you try to, you know, um, hit it with a bat, of course, in computation or even the slightest movement might uh, change or introduce noise. So all of those industry level tests, strength tests or stress tests are not yet done for quantum computers in the R&D level or in that case, the room level uh, quantum computers. So we, it's not sturdy as like your CPUs right now. If I try to uh, move or wobble my laptop right now or increase the temperature, uh, it will be resilient to uh, errors. And, but there are actually errors underneath in the nano uh, in the nano electronic level. But if it you, if you do that in the quantum computer, uh, that would introduce a lot of noise. So one kinetic, the other one is thermal. There could be uh, others as well. Okay. Um, another question is, if quantum systems can boost computing so quickly, wouldn't that cause bottleneck issues when used in tandem with classical systems? 
Ah, so it depends. How do you actually put it with classical computing? So you're not going to parallelize a computation with a classical computer and a quantum computer. Of course, that will delay the classical computing, right? So we try to segment what problems could be done in quantum and what could be done in classical. So for example, the search part would be in uh, uh, the quantum, but for let's say the, the computation or the transformation of a certain database, let's say, uh, let's say injection or insertion to another uh, database would be done by that uh, classical computer. So we need to segregate the problem so that it would not be a bottleneck for one another. So the orchestration there, it depends on the pipeline of your operation. Okay. Um, we can uh, sit back a bit and there's a question. Does quantum computing require a lot of prerequisite knowledge to understand? Uh, they said that they are a high school student and looks very intimidating. At the same time, uh, on a scale of linguistics to physics, how much mathematics will be needed to understand what's ahead? From so home. the level of mathematics that you need is just right here in this lecture series. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we know how hard it is to start quantum computing. So we got you. Awesome. So Sir Brian, one of our members in Quantum Computing Society of the Philippines, uh, commented that my youngest child ran his first quantum circuit when he was first uh, when he was four years old. Wow. Okay, another question. If quantum computing becomes mainstream, does this mean we, uh, eventually we will change how we think about computers and how computers are made? Yes. So that is the, uh, that's the fate of humankind in terms of technology. However, we do not phase out uh, the computers that we have right now. It's just like GPUs. GPUs are a new type of computing methods that probably you're not um, experience uh, you're, you're not doing, but you're experiencing right now, especially when you're trying to game with a gaming computer, right? So you don't know what's behind that, but the math behind that is something that you're not worrying about and you just experience it. And it works along with CPUs. It's something that you'll be experiencing probably in the future as well, wherein we're using them together and the whole architecture of computing is now updated. It's not just uh, in, in way back before in the 1980s, probably you're not, uh, if, if, if you were alive, <laughs> or the 1990s, let's say, or 2000s. All right, let's say, I'm moving the bar to near. So uh, back in the 2000s, if you were studying computing back then, you're not, you're not discussing about GPUs. You're only discussing about CPUs, right? Right now, uh, for those who are in high school right now, you are probably, you already know that the GPU exists and you're trying to study like why, why you're using GPU. It's for gaming, yeah. So, but in, in the mathematical side or the scientific side, GPUs are there to perform a lot of cool stuff that are using, you know, linear algebra. But now we're going to move ahead a bit of the future and we're going to have the idea of those two plus the quantum computer, right? Awesome. Another question from earlier is that uh, how does how do quantum computers communicate with classical computers? Is it the same way that the internet works or like from my phone to my laptop or is there something different about that? Well, uh, we are making it very seamless, but there are specific hardware that you're controlling. There's, those are the inter, what we call interfaces that uh, converts the measurement from quantum computers. So in quantum computers, you have your qubits, right? So in those qubits, uh, when you try to measure them, it, it's term of uh, it, probably in terms of voltages, and those could be read by certain sensors, and those sensors convert that to what's understandable by classical computers, and that's the interface between them. So uh, there are just more specific hardware that converts or, or rather reads information from the quantum level back to the classical level. Now, if you're talking about classical to quantum, that's another thing. So we need to encode classical data into quantum data by certain mathematics but you'll probably discuss in the next few weeks but yeah the idea is we're just using some sort of mathematics before encoding it into quantum then feeding it back to the quantum computer okay so but it's easier when it's a quantum computer to classical computers thank you for that so some are uh saying that uh they were overtaken by a four-year-old in quantum computing, but that's okay, guys. You will be able to run your uh, quantum codes 
next week and you will be able we will be quantum ready after this program okay so um yeah uh just let me oh, yeah a canadian company xanadu uh, created a system that utilizes uh, photons right and uh th th that, that that means that we don't need to use uh cryogenic cooling right and what does this mean for quantum computing for making uh it accessible to the general public as we don't have to use superconductors or cryogenic cooling yeah then that's actually um it solves one part of the decoherence problem. However, the next part of the problem is finding the right material to work with the photo uh, the photonics or the, the right amount uh, or, yeah. Also the whole need to hold those information in certain, uh, certain material, right? And the other one is it's more expensive than using uh, or creating uh, super cooling devices. So the problem there is not in the technical side, but then now the financial side. How do we make it um, manufacturable and it's still cheap once we get to the public? So it's more of back to the business problem or the logistic problems. So we need to find what's cheap and what's efficient. And that's mostly what's going on in any type of uh, tech industry, creating new computing devices. Okay. Thank you for that. Another question. It's a bit high level, so you can just brush through it just so that you can uh, satisfy the curiosity of our uh, participant. But uh, uh, what about the Shor's algorithm? Will it use uh, the will its use in Fourier transforms also be discussed? Ah, the QFTs. I I will leave that to our experts on that day. I think uh, Sir Bobby. We'll be discussing about. Okay, uh, that's shorts. very good. That's a very good question. <clears throat> um, just to discuss Shor's uh, Shor's algorithm, uh, we need uh, probably uh, seven sessions. It's more than the number of sessions here. <laughs> but I'll. Uh, <clears throat> but for this uh, lecture series, I'm going to um, spend only an hour. It's actually very challenging. So I'll just uh, describe how the algorithm works um, and also describe uh, quantum key distribution uh, and general cryptography. But if you're really interested, we have a YouTube uh, lecture series on um, Shor's algorithm and elliptic curve, uh, how to crack them. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that, sir, Bobby. All right. Okay, but for now, guys, um, there's so much things that you can learn about quantum computing. It's like a rabbit hole that you can dig and dig and dig through. But uh, for this uh, session, we'll, we'll let you begin on creating your quantum circuits. And yeah, uh, you can go further than these lessons. And uh, you can join the society and then we can learn together. Okay, so another question from Mam Noeline. Uh, uh, hello, Sir Dylan. I'm planning to begin uh, with my classical method in my study for time series forecasting, then work with quantum computing, and then eventually explore hybrid models of classical and quantum and compare mm -hmm. them at the last part. Uh, I would greatly appreciate if you can suggest or advice on how should I select appropriate quantum computing approach for this. Yeah, so I guess start with what's available literature. So in time series forecasting, luckily I have uh, I'm doing the same research uh, in most parts of my study. So in time series forecasting, there are many ways that you could do it in terms of classical. I believe you know that already. There could be um, long short term memories, RNNs, transformer models, any attention based models, but. Imagine what if they exist as well in quantum. So yes, there is a quantum LSTM already, and it's already. I, be, I believe there's already code for that uh, in Penny Lane, and you can try that out. Uh, quantum transformers are already a thing. They're right now being used in NLP, and one of my lab mates here in Taiwan is actually using transformer quantum transformer models for uh, time series prediction as well. So it's not uh, impossible, and you can try them out. So optimization-wise, you can try to choose your optimization in quantum or classical, and anything, anything's good. Or you can choose a quantum-inspired uh, neural network or do some hybrid optimization or hybrid um, architectures with a classical uh, layer and a quantum layer. 
all of them, all of those combinations you can actually do. You can actually do pure quantum as well. But I do advise still using classical since uh, right now, uh, machine learning would still be best done in classical, but augmented with uh, quantum optimizations. Awesome. There's really so much that we can do with quantum computing and even some uh, applications that were uh, haven't been explored yet. Okay, so one study is like uh, Sir Dylan said, is converting or 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 like uh, applying some classical methods and then doing it on quantum computers. So we have actually two concurrent questions about a quantum entanglement. Um, if we look, if we can link two particles together through quantum entanglement, could we potentially connect two computers and send data across both with zero latency using that? And another question is, uh, how far-fetched would the idea of uh, internet service providers utilizing quantum entanglement yeah, for sending okay. data? Yeah, quantum internet is very interesting. So yes, for the first, first question, there is already ways to do that. Uh, we just need to perform, uh, we need to have very specialized hardware for handling the nodes and entanglement. So we need to have preparation of qubits first before we actually entangle them for uh, industrial use. Um, teleportation, though, is another thing that you could actually look into for ISPs. Now, how far-fetched would be ISPs? Now, that depends on which country you are in right now. Um, U.S. would be using that already for peer-to-peer um, -peer connections. So if you're uh, working with blockchain as well, that's something that you'll be rejoicing about. Uh, China and Japan are using it already, I believe, uh, in their ISPs for very, for very secure VPNs. That's another thing. Uh, I believe also in South Korea. For Taiwan, I believe they use it for the government purpose. Uh, not exactly for general purpose of the ISPs, but for point to point. So it just really depends on the safety criticalness of the network as well as the information being transported. But yes, it is possible. You just need to have proper hardware. And of course, not just the medium that you're trying to consider here, but also encryption. So that is in part of security. Yes, thank you for that. We will actually discuss some of those on the um, quantum key distribution uh, lecture. So on uh, right now, it, it's just a bit longer for to send the data, all of your data or all of the 4K YouTube videos through qubits since it's super expensive. But we're uh, starting to explore using it to transfer keys or security keys for cryptography, as Sir Dylan said. Okay. Um, yeah, another question. Does quantum computing utilize the binary system or a different number system in the lowest level of computing? Or is it a completely different approach that doesn't require something like Boolean algebra? Um, if you're leading for the question, it doesn't. It actually does. So yeah, I still need to use Boolean uh, logic in this. However, uh, the encoding is not in binary, but it's in mostly in qubits. So it, the idea is it is partially in binary, but we're still considering other parts of computation there. But the logic that we're applying is Boolean algebra. Why do you think so? It's because we're still patterning it with classical algorithms in most cases, and classical algorithms are uh, exhibiting in Boolean algebra. And most of the computations as well in uh, in classical, I mean, rather in quantum, uh, expects you to be in binary. So yes, you still need to have the knowledge of Boolean algebra and, bo and binary in terms of operations. In coding, uh, we're, we, do have a spe uh, we do have special ideas or rather concepts in uh, quantum encoding on how do we operate those uh, quantum information. Okay, thank you for those very insightful answers. So um, guys, if you're feeling overwhelmed, don't worry. Uh, it will get better as the lecture series goes by. So um, for now, you can save your questions and uh, send them to me on Discord and we can uh, list them and so that Sir Dylan and the team can get back to you with further uh, answers or even resources that you can read. And also at this point, um, yeah, I think some of our brains are a bit mushy from all those uh, physics and, 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 and jargons and all those stuff. Um, again, thank you, Sir Dylan, for that very insightful uh, introduction to quantum computing and application. And for now, um, let me just share my screen. Okay. 
so energy check energy check uh what's your uh mood right now is it one z -z 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 -z? two interesting and then three motivated okay so i'm getting some ones some trees some twos another one 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 <laughs> super sleepy another two is interesting interesting another one two three another 2.5 four four years old don't worry about it. <laughs> and then i'm getting some two some trees okay 1.5 1.75 okay all right okay clever position of one two and one i like the cat face in one super cheap all right thank you for your active participation everyone at this point, we can take a 10-minute break for, for yeah, we deserve this 10-minute break. So we just sit back, probably get something to eat. And yes, we will get back after 10 minutes. All right. Okay.
Okay, we're back. So I hope that you had a uh, nice chat or with your family or you had a cup of water or you had you were able to stretch your arms a bit and prepare your mind again for our next topic. So uh, at this point, let me just... Okay, so at this point, uh, you might have some questions about like how we do we actually do this on 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 hardware scale okay so i'm here to uh answer that and um it might not be super technical but uh, it, it's only in an introductory talk on how do we uh create qubits or uh, qubit modalities we should say or how do what what are some approaches that we can do so that we can uh, exhibit some of these uh, quantum computing properties so yeah uh, it will just be an easy talk uh, i uh, i myself is not an expert on this yet but i think uh, as an uh, aspiring electronics engineer uh, i would like to know more about the hardware and also i uh, will do also like you to know some background so that when when you're coding you, you have the context like ah this is a qubit and uh you, you can do some stuff like that so you can already know some of the limitations or some restrictions on how we program some quantum circuits and algorithms okay so um in a sense this is how i interpret quantum computing so using quantum physics to compute okay so right now on the classical side of things we're using um some pulses, electrical pulses, or even some light, right? So some photonics computing uh, out there. But in this case, my idea or the general thought would be we're using quantum physics, we're using uh, the nature, you, should, you can say, to compute. And then basically we're just going to encode our problems to a system, a quantum system, let it do its, its thing, and optimize and do all those cool stuff, quantum stuff, freaky stuff. And then we can read the system and get our answer. So that's basically uh, the most basic uh, explanation that I can give on how we do quantum computing. Okay, so as I've said, uh, we have a system, a quantum system. Okay, so what does a quantum system look like? Okay, so uh, I, I was reading on some of the um, comments or uh, chats here on Zoom, and one mentioned in, uh, they call this uh, in Ant-Man, right? In Quantumania. So uh, basically what Ant-Man does is he shrinks into a super small size, right? And then uh, he can see all of those uh all those small scale uh uh atoms like that so th that's basically it like um having very small scale you can see some uh exhibits of quantum physics so it's very different from the macro scale like us right so we're probably governed by uh, the newton's law and then for the very big parts uh probably einstein's theory of relativity but for the smaller parts, like atoms, electrons, photons, or light, we can use quantum physics, okay? So as long as our system can exhibit quantum uh, quantum properties, uh, we will discuss quantum properties on the next lecture, but as long as we can do that, we can use quantum computing, okay? So I've listed the five main uh, quantum modalities or approaches that we can use. So we have electrons, we have photons, atoms, ions, and even circuits. Okay. All right. So let's start with electrons. Okay. So do you remember during your chemistry class, uh, you were uh, writing about quantum numbers, right? Quantum numbers like the shell, subshell, the azimuthal, and all those stuff. So you might remember spin, right? Uh, electron spin. It's a property of electrons wherein uh it's embedded on the electron itself like uh based on it uh on the composition of the atom uh you would have different spin for different uh electrons okay so what we do is encode information on actual electrons all right and then we let it interact whether it would be on the up state of the spin or on the down state of the spin so as you can see here 
like uh, the the red blobs are representing representing uh, electrons, and then the arrows represents the spin. Okay, so this is what we call spin qubits, or uh, you might even say uh, quantum dots, or uh, uh, what they call silicon dots, or silicon uh, qubits. So as you can see here uh, on the uh, image on the right, so we have some like circuits around that, and then we have those violet things. So that would represent our electrons. And we send signals to that, or atoms even, we send signals through that uh, so that the uh, quantum properties, which is in this case the spin, gets uh, altered. And then we can do some computations on that. Okay, easy enough. All right. So uh, again, we call it sil uh, silicon spin or quantum dots. And then some uh, pros that it has is that we're using silicon to manufacture these chips. So it leverages existing semiconductor technologies, and it has strong gate fidelities. Strong gate fidelities means that our circuit doesn't break or that our, when we encode information on, this, uh, on the electrons, it doesn't lose that information. So that what, that's what we mean by fidelities. And then as we uh, put some, uh, as we manipulate these electrons uh, using gates, right, using gates, um, sometimes it might decohere, or sometimes it might be uh, removed from quantum state, right? So uh, a pro in using quantum dots or silicon spins is that it has some strong gate fidelities and speed. Speed meaning we can put a lot of um, a manipulation on that on very fast rates. Some cons, of course, uh, as, as we've said, uh, we we have so much approaches in quantum, and we're exploring all of these approaches. Some have a pros that some other approaches have cons, and vice versa. So in this case, for silicon spin or quantum dots, it requires cryogenics, or it, it well, requires it to be in a super low temperature, like 10 millikelvin, 20 millikelvin, so uh, near absolute zero. So it requires huge uh, facilities to even be on the uh, state that it requires. So uh, another con would be uh, only few entangled gates to date with low coherence time. And of course, um, we're reading actual electrons. So it's going to be hard to uh, get information from those, right? And then uh, interference, like from other electrons, like things um, interact with each other, right? Uh, like that's how we do chemical bonding, right? Electrons interact, atoms interact. So another con would be, of course, there will be some crosstalks about uh, from these atoms or from these electrons. Uh, some companies that does quantum, uh, this approach in quantum would be Intel. So they have some uh, amazing research in quantum dots. We also have uh, Dirac. Uh, we have um, silicon quantum computing, quantum real motion, and quantum brilliance. All right. Okay. What about light? Okay, light. What about the photons? So we can see, uh, if you remember, that light can be represented like uh, the wave particle duality of light, that it can be a quanta of energy. At the same time, it can be represented as a wave that is traveling. Okay, so being small on that small scale, it also exhibits quantum properties. All right. It also it can interact with other atoms. It can interact with other photons. So as the light travels, so as you can see on the image on the right, right, uh, we have these intersections of uh, uh, waveguides or fiber optics, right? We have these uh, circuits wherein the light can actually interact. That's how we do uh, quantum manipulation, or that's how we do uh, gates on photonics so what we can do is uh we have of course discrete where in squid photonics wherein we have like the polarity of light wherein it is it horizontally polarized polarized or is it vertically polarized and we can make that as our uh, binary representation right so horizontal would be the zero and then the vertical would be the one and then we can have the light on superposition, meaning that it 
it's both on on the horizontal and a vertical uh, polarization at the same time. Okay, so I see a question. Uh, does the series cover only the theoretical mathematics and programming part of quantum computing? Or are we also going to tackle and get hands-on experience with uh, hardware as well? So for now, um, we're going to talk about the theoretical part and actually build some circuits and do some simulations. But we will work, we'll get back to you on actually interfacing on, on actual quantum computers. So it's uh, a lot of work to do on our end but uh, if we can we will uh do that so that you can actually like experiment on you, you can imagine like using photons to do your calculations so yeah very nice question uh, we will work on that yeah thank you thank you as well okay so some pros um extremely fast gate speeds okay so if you know light travels very fast at the same time uh, you, we can actually, uh, that, that property of light being, being very fast means that we can do a lot of computations in a short period of time. Uh, as mentioned earlier as well, um, photonics doesn't need cryogenic cooling, uh, cryogenic or vacuums even. Um, sometimes we use um, it on, uh, we have like uh, photons on a medium, like uh, uh what they call this uh, waveguides like that or, or fiber optics and that's a pro because we already have um, that infrastructure right we already have fiber internet so imagine just having like just a bit better fiber optics some specialized fiber optics and we can do photonics so right now there's this company called uh, Connect, and they're actually using uh, existing fiber network uh a fiber network um infrastructure to send qubits from one place to another so i think they set a world record on the farthest qubits that they were able to send through a, a fiber optic cable and then uh, another pros on photonics would be the small footprint uh, so the thing is uh, those cryogenics are very large and require so much hardware and not leaving that really uh, gives us the advantage of having a small footprint. And then it can also leverage existing CMOS fabrication. So CMOS is a complementary metal oxide semiconductors. So uh, yeah, uh, the, the fabrications that we are uh, already using for like our phones, our, our chips. So we can uh, just add some modifications and it's ready for producing uh, photonics chips. Of course, there would be cons on this. We have noise from photon loss. As the light travels, of course, it would uh, have some losses and some photons would get absorbed by some atoms. And then um, each program requires a new or its own chip. And then, of course, uh, photons don't naturally interact. So um, as we've said, photons travel really quickly. So there's really a little... Uh, window for photons to interact so there are some challenges where 2q or 2 qubits of photons uh, would interact so uh but there are some strides that are uh, continuing from psi quantum from xanadu from quicks and from orca computing so very uh fast uh, researches that's being done on this side as well okay next atoms Okay, uh, probably this is one of my favorite modalities, uh, to be honest. So uh, atoms, like what, what's better way to have some quantum systems than uh, atoms themselves? So we can see here on the right side, the images of some two particles, right? And then we have this like uh, purple or pink things that are on it. So that's actually light, okay? So we're actually trapping atoms using light, okay? And then we're letting them interact together, okay? So do you remember on your chemistry classes, we have like uh, interactions like polar and non-polar interactions. And then we also have like van der Waals interactions. So if we have atoms near each other and then we fire a microwave or a laser pulse to that um, atom, 
it actually expands and the the, atom, the electrons on that get super energized no so remember that uh, some of our atoms for example have shells right shells of seven okay uh, uh se shells of six uh, right like that and uh, like uh, electron shells probably like a, a huge atom have seven and then when we energize those atoms with lasers it actually expands to a shell of 70 so uh, our atoms gets really big so and scale of micrometers so uh, our atoms generally uh, on on the neutral side gets on um, two nanometers and then when it's energized to subshell of 70 it gets big into 70 micrometers so uh, imagine having those two atoms and then you energize one atom and then you energize another and then they get super big so you can get some uh, interactions with uh, the van der waals interactions from that so um this is what a a neutral atom quantum compute computer would look like so we have like a vacuum here on the middle and then we have some lasers that uh, pulses energy into those atoms so on the right side we can see some graphs so the purple ones represent the atoms and then you can see that they are connected in such a way that they represent something so if you can see the first one the first uh, image it looks like kind of like the uh, the continents right so we can actually um arrange the atoms in such a way that it represents our problems and then we uh, energize some of those those atoms and then let them interact and then give us the most optimized solutions so uh sir dylan will talk more about uh, optimization on the next lessons but generally imagine using atoms so you will uh put your atoms arrange those atoms into your problem or, or in the map and then let them interact uh, using uh, van der Waals uh, interactions and then you will get a solution out of that so very interesting so of course there would be some pros and cons of this uh, pros would be long coherence times meaning that they retain information quantum information much longer the atoms are perfect and consistent such that um you won't it's hard to lose an atom than it's losing a photon and then strong connectivity so as i've said you can arrange them in such a way that they're next to each other and then they can uh, interact and then external cryogenics is not required so as long as we bombard them and we trap them with light uh we actually put them in place such that it's on the ultra ultra cold state already so as long as we can trap those on uh, using light it's already on the ultra low state another question we can represent uh, our problems using graphs <laughs> no <laughs> that's so funny but yeah uh, imagine uh imagine like you're 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 a business owner like a coffee shop business owner your starbucks example and then you would want to place your um you would want to place your uh stores in pampanga for example so what you would do is uh survey the following uh places that you can put those and then uh graph pampanga and put those atoms on those uh, sites that you can put and then let the atoms interact on the quantum computer and then you can have some atoms that are lit up at the end so you can put those stores your stores on those uh, lit up atoms and then you can have like uh, the most uh, widest spread with the least amount of stores so that's what we do when we represent uh, our problems using graphs so <laughs> that's super funny but yeah uh it's actually uh they actually did that already on boston so if you know boston with uh mit and boston dynamics and they actually uh graphed boston on on quantum uh, neutral atoms and then they did some optimizations on how you can uh which places would you put a store or coffee shop so that's really funny but we can uh, use that definitely another con would be this is ultra high vacuums 
again, if we're gonna have sp suspended atoms inside a vacuum chamber, you can have other atoms like running around freely on that space. So it needs ultra high vacuums and lasers. It needs super precise and super clear, super good lasers. So some companies uh, that uh, do neutral atom quantum computing is called Quanta uh, Atom Computing, QERA, and Pascal. So actually, Pascal is having a uh, hackathon right now. So yeah, you can sign up for that if you want. Okay, next would be ions. Okay, so ions, if you remember from your chemistry class, ions are charged particles. It could be negative or positively charged particles. So as we know, positive attracts negative and positive repels positive and negative repels but negative. So we can actually use those charged particles and trap them. Uh, using like rods that uh, have uh, that are positive or negative, and we can change those interactions so that we can trap those atoms. So that's what we call them trap ions. Okay, so trap ion quantum computing. Um, so yeah, so as uh, we've said again, from neutral atoms, on neutral atoms, it's more about like the size of the of the atoms and like the uh, van der Waals interaction, but for the trapped ions, it's more about like uh microwaves and uh like moving around and 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 different properties of trap of ions. Okay, so some pros: extremely high gate fidelities, and you can actually trap those ions very long. And have they have long coherence time? Coherent time, coherence time again means that they retain information much longer, so that you don't lose your quantum state. And then extreme cryogenic cooling not required, uh, and ions are perfect and incons and, and consistent. Uh, yeah, and it's much more consistent than having electrons. Uh, you have actual ions or atoms, right? And then uh, for cons, we have slow gate times, meaning that you would need to wait a bit longer uh, before you can uh, do some calculations on that. And then uh, you, you have low connectivity between qubits and lasers are hard to align in scale. Again, ultra high vacuum is required on trapped ions and uh, ion charges may restrict uh, scalability. So some of the uh, companies that use that is IonQ, some another one is Continuum and Oxford Ionics, AQT, and Universal Quantum. Okay, so we have another question. Hello, since atoms can occupy the states or verbatim lit up and not lit up, would they be more classical than quantum? So, um, so uh, the lit up part would be if they are on that puff up state and then uh, not lit up would be on their neutral state. Right, and the quantum side on that is these uh, atoms. As we energize the whole area, these atoms can get that energy and puff up, and then uh, they can exert or ex uh, th they can uh, get out or they can um, yeah put out energy and probably produce some atoms, uh, photons, and then go back to their neutral state. So uh, that's the quantum part, wherein they can go to that puff up state and then to that neutral state and you can have some superposition on that meaning that um uh, as long as you energize the system there's a tendency for the atoms to be on the low state or on the high state so um the classical part on that would be after you read out on that uh, on after you you read out your system you can see like some atoms that are lit up or like puff up and those would be the solutions on your problems. So we're still using quantum uh, quantum physics and uh, quantum phenomena uh, to uh, change those atoms from puff up and then not puff up uh, state. Uh, next, another question. So each graph is a represent representation of the atom state. No, the graph represents the position of the atoms. And then at the end, whether they are puff up or not would be the representation of the state. And then if we play our cards right and we graph them in such a way that it represents our problems, uh, as long as we can solve or we are as long as that uh, we can have the atoms interact, we can have the optimized solution for our problems.
Okay. All right. So those four uh, modalities are very uh, straightforward in a sense that ah, they are very small and that, oh, yeah, they definitely have some quantum properties. But we can also use circuits, right? Like some interactions on that. Um, so uh, if you remember or if you would know that some circuits uh, like oscillates, if you know about AC or alternating current, right, it, it oscillates in 60 hertz. The thing is some circuits, uh, particularly uh, RL circuits, also oscillates on that. So based on those oscillations, we can have it on different states of oscillation. So it could be on lows or on a low level, a low energy oscillation or in a high level oscillation. And during uh, those would be our qubit states, like zero on the low level and even one on the high level. And as we energize or uh, apply some energy through, throughout the circuit, we can uh, have some superposition, superposition such that uh, the oscillation of the circuit can jump from the low energy state or the high energy state. So that's how we exhibit uh, quantum properties on that. So you might have seen this uh, picture of quantum computer like something that looks like a chandelier. So uh, usually uh, these are the superconducting quantum computing. So uh, yeah, um, we're using superconductors and we're using some JJ or Josephson junctions for those. Okay. Okay, so some pros would be high gate speeds. So it's a circuit. So you can uh, control the circuits on very high speeds. You can leverage standard lit lithographic processes. So uh, we're printing uh, superconducting qubits on silicon. So uh, as you know, silicon is the most studied element on the periodic table because of the research that we've done for semiconductors. So we can already leverage that. That's why uh, superconducting has a jump start on the quantum uh, quantum approaches. Of course, um, it also has some cons. It requires cryogenic cooling, as we've said. Um, to for the materials to have that uh superconducting state, right? Um, they need to be super cooled, like ten millikelvin, twenty millikelvin. So we have those silicon chips and then we have those superconducting materials on the middle right so it's not entirely um, silicon only it also has some other superconducting uh, materials on the middle and then it has short coherence time meaning that the oscillations or the uh, the uh, quantum information might get lost uh, very quickly and microwave interconnect frequencies is still not well understood so we're uh, interacting with those with microwaves. So some companies that uses uh, uh, superconducting qubits would be IBM, IBM Q, IBM Quantum, and then uh, Google, of course, Rigetti, QTech, uh, OQC or Oxford Quantum Circuits, IQM, uh, QCI, and then others as well. All right. So yeah, um, that's my very low, high level actually, very uh, introductory, um, uh, talk on some approaches that we can use, right? So um, moving forward, as we build our circuits, uh, we can think of some atoms interacting and dancing around and doing our quantum our, our, and solving our problems for us, right? So, all right, okay. So um, at this point, probably we can have some more questions. Um, it's already 7 p.m. Maybe we can extend for a bit and then we can answer a bit of questions. All right. So thank you, Sir Brian and Sir Jeff, for already answering some of those questions. Okay. All right. So um, another would be, an, we can talk more about how to access these quantum computers. So um, some of these quantum computers are already connected to uh, the cloud and you can access them through AWS bracket. And then, um, yeah, there's some, uh, we can talk more about those, but yeah, uh, you can actually um, interface with those already. Question, do these circuits get extremely hot? Does this mean that 
semiconductors are submerged in extremely cold temperature, like maybe liquid nitrogen. So um, they do need to be extremely cold, but they don't get hot. Uh, yeah. So uh, we 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 use super con uh, we use uh, cryogenics not because it gets super hot. We use cryogenics so that we can have that property. The thing is, uh, materials doesn't exhibit superconduction when it's on one Kelvin or above or even higher. Uh, higher. So they only exhibit uh, superconducting properties when they are near absolute zero. Okay, so it's not a question of do they get hot. It's question of uh, can they exhibit quantum properties. Okay, as for the second question, does this mean that semiconductors are submerged in extremely cool temperature? Uh, is extremely cool temperature um no it's a different kind of cooling they're not submerged it's, uh it's more like a an uh, a process wherein we get uh the energy we suck out the energy from this uh circuit so it's called dilution refrigeration so the the thing that you, you can see yan yung parang they're like layers and for every layer we get energy out of that so it's a different topic on get how how do we get energies from those? But as we move down the path, no, at the end we would have like ten millikelvin, twenty millikelvin of temperatures. And then uh, another question: If they are on the cloud, would that mean that uh more processing time, the more people access them at current time, like limited hardware for? Yes, definitely. So there's definitely a queue that you need to wait wait up. So uh, what we do is we have jobs. We, so we package our circuits, our, uh, our, our problems into jobs, and then we send them to our computers. And then they're, they, get, uh, they get queued up and for that. And uh, yeah, uh, you can wait for a day or even a week for, for your uh, results to come back. So that's for the public access quantum computers. But of course, if you have a quantum computer on your own, you can just send a job on it and get a results back. Um, yeah. So do, do we have other questions? Okay. All right. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, so if you have more questions about this, we can talk about it all night long. Um, we can you can send me a message on Discord, and uh, we can probably make a channel for that, like uh, quantum hardware, quantum software, and different channels, so that we can learn more about that. So hopefully you had fun, uh, getting to know more about how we actually do a quantum. On, on a hardware level, and hopefully this would be a good context when we create our circuits on the next uh, sessions. Okay. All right. At this point, uh, we would like to, we would like to ask everyone to please turn on their cameras so that we can have this momentous occasion, our uh, photo op. So that uh, I am. So hello everyone. So let me stop sharing my screen. And then, ayan. So, ayan. Mukhang, mukhang fresh pa sila, ah. Mukhang, uh, ano, ay, hindi pa Saturday. Oh, nakapag-recharge na ba kayo on that? Ayan, sige. So, okay. um Can we ask Sir Jeff? Can you screenshot po? um I'm on my ano po, live stream. Okay. So, hello, hello. Ayan. We're super glad to finally meet you. Kahit na virtually pa lang. So hopefully you perform well and uh uh will be able to attend the hackathon in the future uh on November. So yeah, so we can meet face to face. Okay, Ayan. So hello, uh, hello. That was how uh, how do we screenshot this? Uh, oh, we can. Just... I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay, it's okay. I'll just screenshot na lang po. Uh, I, all right. I can do it. I can do it. So I can do okay. it. I I've already okay. taken some screenshots. All okay. right. Thank you for Sir yeah. Sir Elmer. The count right. of one, two, ready. One quantum. Okay. Okay. Another one. Another one. 
Probably okay. na next page. Smile lang kayo. Okay. One, two, three. Smile. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you for, for that one. Let me share my screen again. Okay. All right. So that uh that we're nearing the end of our first session. So uh we hope that na kahit na very new ang topics that we've discussed for tonight. We hope that uh you, you've gained some interest and curiosity uh throughout this uh technology. Okay, so do, please do not be uh overwhelmed. We will provide the sources uh, that you can read or uh, some even materials that you can uh, ex have some exercise on. Okay, so expect another email tonight or tomorrow morning on the homeworks that you can uh, practice on and you can you need to submit and then uh, some other materials as well. Okay, so Sir Bob, do you have something to say to our participants? Well, thank you very much um, Yeah, for... For attending, I think at at one time we were about 130 participants, and I can see from the chat that uh, some have various levels of um, of experience. Some I think are already good at this. So if you're good, then we would definitely you know need your help to uh, also uh, help other people to um, to learn. Uh, quantum computing to be at the same level as you and um yeah so thank you very much uh, for uh, mom cherry for uh jeff and you know um and and for the members of one quantum who are here who are here and most especially thanks for Javas for doing a very nice job in uh, hosting this event all thank right you. thank you everyone Again, our you session guys. is uh, officially uh, concluded for now. For now, yeah, and see you next week again. Yeah, next week. Uh, invite your classmates, ha, uh, especially for those that uh, already registered but haven't even uh, opened their emails yet. Sabi niya baka na punta lang sa spam nila or something so that they can join as well. All right. So if you have questions, again, just chat or message me on Discord uh, and then... Uh, we will send another email on your next steps on your homework. Again, uh, uh, also, uh, if you haven't yet, please enter the Google Classroom. No, uh, don't ma propose ang ating homeworks. All right. Okay. Thank you for that, everyone. Good night and have a nice dinner and have a nice rest. Okay. Salamat, Thank sir. you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dylan, for the sir. presentation. Thank you, Thanks, Thanks, Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Yes, the recording will be accessible. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, we will send the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sige, sige. Have a great night. Yes, yes. Okay, I will put you on the waiting list. Yeah, and para ano.